Thanks everyone and welcome to Sydney's Central Park. This project is a joint venture between Fraser's Property Australia, who principally are residential developers, and our joint venture partner is Sekisui House of Japan, Japan's leading house building company. The, the judges I'd like to thank for rewarding us our regional zone and the opportunity for Bertram and I to uh, extend our credentials to the symposiums. Those who are not familiar with Sydney, and it's a long way away, and tell me flying over here, so I can reassure you. But from Sydney, we have the Opera House and the famous bridge, and we're down here at this end. This is Central Railway, and our site is in here. So as we zoom in, sorry, I'll go back one. You can see again, this is part of what's now our Darling Harbour. We have our central railway station, hence where we started the word central. The area around you'll see Sydney is flanked with a lot of green areas, a park where Australians really value our outdoor spaces. Moving on, this is the project as it's been developed. Um, you can see UTS, which is a, a college behind us. We have Sydney University and uh, Notre Dame University. University here surrounding us. The site was originally an operating brewery for 150 years in Sydney's early days. It was there, for, for closed off to the community and as a consequence when the brewing industry subsided and moved out to the outer suburbs, the site was re redeveloped. Fraser's and Secretary purchased the site and with a concept plan that had been approved by the Department of Planning and uh, the local council. And you can see here, one central park was originally these buildings here. You can see the park, which is the main feature of the development, was approximately 6,000 square metres. Fraser's undertook to redevelop this concept plan and for design excellence engaged with Foster and Partners of London who had also partnered with Atelier's John Novell of Paris, and in conjunction we joined with uh, Johnson Pilkin Walker of Sydney. We redeveloped the concept plan to develop one central park with John Novell. Yeah, John was excited about being uh, developing here in Sydney. It's his first building in Australia, and it's an opportunity to develop the building in conjunction with the main park. You can see here where we've increased the size of the park and part of the design was to take the park up into the building. Sydney's climate is basically a humid subtropical zone. But because we're on the coast, we're always also very conscious of climate change and everything else, as well as suffering from a lot of the old Nemo uh, southern oscillation uh, weather we get large variances. We get flooding, droughts, high temperature, storms, all through the, the year. The building one central park is part of an overall 5.8 hectares development site and it's approximately 1.5 kilometres from Sydney Town Hall. The urban renewal we named Central Park simply because it was near Central Railway and because of the park. Not a copy from, from uh, Manhattan. The total development site is 255,500 square metres of development. The park itself we increased to 6,500 square metres and decided we wanted a unique building, hence where we partnered with John Neval to come up with a concept with the cantilever and John's desire to take the park up into the building. There is an image today of what our building is starting to look like. You can see the John Neville building here, the other buildings flanking our main park. All of this part of the site is now developed and we're concentrating on this part of the site here now. One central park itself is 68,000 square metres of GFA, comprising 19,200 of non-residential or retail and 48,400 of residential. 
Below the building, this is a view from the park. The lower levels of the building contain retail. And, and this, this is the Western Tower. Uh, it comprises 17 levels and 240 apartments, whilst the main tower itself contains 383 apartments, with the top 38 above the Sky Garden. Um, is an oasis was designed there to create a oasis in the sky for those residents. It was interesting to see the Singapore Infraferris as the Sky Garden as well. <coughs> Pardon me. With the 34 levels of residential, part of the design was to open up the facade and provide residents with a, an alternative habitat during the, the uh, changing weather conditions. We had developed in one of our earlier projects what we call the Lagiers, which is a flexible indoor, outdoor or enclosed balcony space. The, the building itself contained a number of elements. First of all, the green walls of Patrick Blanc. There's about 1,200 square metres of Patrick's green walls on the buildings. And you can see there the architecture, the design. Patrick is an artist and he selects the plants and there's about 38,000 plants within those green walls. Apart from the green walls, there's about five kilometres of horizontal planters around the building. And there's about 78,000 plants in those. Those plants are hydroponically grown. <coughs> Pardon me, Tra travelling in planes. Um, the outdoor space is within the apartments and it's nighttime view. You can see that the, the building itself has a series of balconies as well as indoor lodges. Here we've, you can see that the panels, two metres high panels slide back, giving opening onto the outside. These bifold doors come across and you can be an enclosed balcony or an indoor outdoor space depending on the weather conditions. This allows, the, the large openings allow people to enjoy the weather conditions as it suits. Below that and between the two buildings is what we have is our uh, pool and, and jacuzzi area uh, to enjoy uh, around the, throughout the year. <coughs> Pardon me. Apart from the living wall reduces, the living walls reduce heat gain onto the building by some 2.4 watts per square metre and uh, window loss by 3.6 watts per square metre. This equates to 5% reduction in peak cooling and 20% reduction in peak heating, um, giving us our five star. The items impressive of this building are our heliostat and our cantilever. Now, the heliostat was designed to provide some sun shading. The lighting, in effect, by Jan Casali of uh, Paris is a lighting display as part of our public art contribution. Putting the, the trusses together was a difficult task. You can see we installed them on the ground and progressively lifted them up using the buildings on top and then extending them out. The large crane here was brought across from the other side of Australia and that single lift was 110 tonne. The structural engineers, Robert Bird and Partners, and our contractors, Watt, Wattpack, did a wonderful job in getting all this together. A special gantry was then installed underneath, which runs off the side of the cantilever to service the heliostats. There you see the the vegetation on the buildings and also the heliostat mirrors being positioned. Also, the sustainability is one of the major initiatives of the site. Not only do we deliver five star, green star residential buildings, part of that was <coughs> to introduce a water treatment plant on site to produce 1,000 kilolitres per day capacity of recycled water, grade A water. That use is used for irrigation, it's used for our central thermal plant, and also used for toilet flushing and laundry. The aim is to develop, on the project is developed, 
uh, water neutrality. Our central thermal plant is there to develop and for us it is an important part in giving up our five-star credentials. Um, there is this philo philosophical uh, chestnut about uh, a tree in a forest and it goes like, it goes like this. Uh, if a tree falls in a forest and decays and nobody sees it, uh, did it exist? And uh, then the uh, environmental follow-up joke is, uh, of course the tree existed and so did the illegal logging operation that cut it down in the first place. And so this is about the visibility of sustainable uh, design. Um, we could extend this and say, well, uh, if we do all these wonderful sustainable things and uh, nobody, ca nobody can see them, do they exist really? And so the visibility linked to, to the existence of this agenda of sustainability is a hugely important thing for architects because things you can't see uh, won't register with the public and won't work on the public opinion. And we need to do that. As, uh, as we've seen, 50% of the people in this country still don't believe we have a, we have a problem <coughs> with the climate. Now, part of the problem of visibility is that uh, we only have this graph. CO2 is invisible. You can't smell it. You can see it. You can't hear it. Um, but we know that its, uh, uh, that its levels are increasing. And uh, this is a unique situation uh, in the past 650,000 years. Uh, and so that alone should give, give cause to alert, uh, but for a lot of people it still doesn't. So um, here's another uh, recent development of uh, scientific models, what, uh, what is happening to the atmosphere, uh, to the warming uh, of, the, of the globe. And there are three scenarios basically. Top is we're doing nothing, uh, the middle is we're doing something, and the bottom is um, we're doing everything we can. And if you look at the top right, uh, you, you see a red globe, and that means uh, everywhere the temperature will rise about, by about uh, an average of four degrees. And that's a fantastic place to live for reptiles and dinosaurs, but probably not for human beings. So uh, we have a consensus um, among scientists that uh, we need to go green, and we know what that means. We need, we need to work on the uh, demographic growth. <coughs> Don't really know how to do that yet. Uh, we need to work on uh, how wealth is, uh, is working against, uh, against the warming of the climate and how uh, we produce energy, etc. Every one of these items on the list needs to be approved on. Now, this is the caricature of uh, what sustainable design would look like or what, what going green would look like. You have the Stone Age hippies and then the greenwash that doesn't work, uh, the trees going through the roof. If we want to look at sustainability um, from, a, from a solid scientific uh, standpoint, we need to look at the technologies that exist today and try to transplant them into architecture and see how we can do this. This is Almeria in, uh, in the southeast of Spain. And you see this white zone here at the bottom. Uh, it looks like snow. But if you look at the zoom on the left, it's actually greenhouses. It's a huge area that already today is covered with greenhouses that are growing vegetables hydroponically in a place where you couldn't do agriculture otherwise. So less energy, less water, and less pesticides. Another uh, technology we got interested in is um, heliostats. And so we're looking at Las Vegas at the north of this map here and a solar plant in the center of the, uh, of the uh, aerial view. And again, we're zooming into this area. And what we're finding is 300,000 mirrors that are redirecting sunlight onto a, uh, onto a receiver tower and are producing 377, uh, 377 uh, megawatt of electricity uh, compared to 500 megawatt uh, uh, coal-fired power plant. That is a fantastic improvement. So this message is so important uh, that a major institution like the Lincoln Center commissioned the artist John Garrard to uh, install this, uh, this piece on the main square to bring this information to the people, that people can actually realize that these new forms of energy exist, that we might be able to work with them. So how can we work with that in our project, in architecture? It had to be more than just a symbol. It had to work uh, technically, of course, and it had to work architecturally. It had to make sense for the city. 
So this is the early, uh, early sketch of this uh, idea of using a, a giant reflector and heliostats on the roof of the smaller tower and plants around the building. I'll go into the de detail of how that evolved. Now, the, the reason for bringing up the park along the, uh, along the building, uh, we're looking at Sydney up here. Compared to New York, Sydney has about three to four parks in walking distance, 10 minute walking distance from anywhere you are in the city. So this is an outdoor culture. This is already uh, a new way of, of uh, urban living. And so, as we see the size of our park, park it's really very small in this, in this context. And so uh, the idea started coming up that we might want to magnify it, to show it in the skyline, also perhaps to invent a new type of high rise. So the way we, uh, we looked at it is we said, there is already the, uh, the modern concept of the tower and the park. What if we did a park in the tower? And so we started bringing up the, uh, the park in the tower, around the tower, in two different ways. One on, on Broadway, the more vertical way, facing the uh, vertical campus of the adjacent university. And on the uh, residential side, with the smaller scale residential neighborhoods next to the building, in a more scattered way, and also we didn't need as much shading there. So the public spaces also follow the same principle. We're, um, we're exporting, or we're, we're extending the park into the building. Every one of these spaces is a kind of a garden, imaginary or real with plants or with images. So this is what that looks like in, in proportion to the size of the building. You see the ground floor here with the two lobbies on the east and west side uh, and a retail atrium in the center. This is the terrace between the towers, the rock garden, and then at the top, the sky garden. And in the section of the building, you can see that these um, spaces are related. You see the atrium. From the atrium, you can see the heliostat, and it, it receives light from there. And as you start seeing these rays, you understand that the entire section of the building is a translation of the functional diagram of these heliostats. Sun hits the heliostats on the lower tower, they reflect to the reflector, and the light goes down in the atrium. Now these are early uh, images of the elevations of the buildings, and the plants are magnified. They're way too big uh, compared to the people, but uh, the point here is that uh, the plants are a building material here in this project. Uh, their color, their texture, their porosity, uh, their scale uh, is the makeup of the, of the facade skin. From the inside of the apartments, they frame the views. Uh, they bring the immediacy, aggressive immediacy of the city into the background, the plants into the foreground, and they filter the light uh, and give you these dappled lights and shadows on the, on the floor. You open the seven foot wide doors, sliding doors, the plants come inside the apartment. They're part of the, of, uh, of the apartment, of the living room. Now you look at the scale of this operation here and you understand that there had to be an infrastructure for this. You can't just uh, plant, uh, uh, plant plants on a balcony and then hope that the rainwater will suffice. And uh, you, you've heard uh, uh, Michael explain the uh, the recycling plant, black water recycling plant, every shower, every hand wash uh, goes into the recycling plant and irrigates the plants around the building. So as the density grows of the plants, I mean, we've been growing them for a year before they were even brought onto the building so that they would do their work right from the start. And the plant is made of a, a double wall container basically out of polyethylene, like a garbage bin. And uh, they're so repetitive that they're actually fairly inexpensive. And the base cost of this building, with its planters and heliostats, is comparable to that of the subsequent uh, stages that you see on the right here, that have none of these features. So these are, again, the Patrick Blanc's vertical walls. And the selection of these plants was incredibly important, because it's a um, Darwinian game that we're playing here. And the plants have to survive in each one of these very specific conditions with wind and sun exposure. 
And then we move on to the reflector and the heliostat. Uh, it's like a baldachin suspended on a cantilever, which is a sky garden here. And it's really hovering above the terrace between the towers. It receives light from these heliostats on the lower tower. They shoot this light down onto a glass roof over the atrium, into the atrium, and onto an underground garden that connects with the park. The whole atrium is bathed in this light that shimmers because of the water on top of the roof. Uh, the water filters the infrared, so it's a very cool light. And in the winter, when we want this warmth, we just drain the water off that roof. Now, this is an experimental uh, project here because we can't model these things. And so we're going to have to measure empirically how uh, this is performing. And then we will rewrite the program to make sure that uh, it improves over time. This is the cantilever with the sky garden. You reach this sky garden over this red bridge. And when the door opens, you're entering uh, a different way of living. It's like a country house in the sky. You have a barbecue, a fridge. Uh, you have a dining table. You have lounge chairs. You have a flowering garden. Uh, and you even have a bathtub. So a whole family could be there on a weekend for, for the day and they wouldn't have to drive out into the country. They could just spend the day there, barbecue. And this is the East Lobby. We're pulling here, we're pulling the planters deep into the building over this double height. We're growing bamboos there, and the sunlight projects the leaf shadows onto the uh, veneer paneling. And at night, similar scenario, but with the electric lighting. So these veneer panels are made of bamboo. So that's a more renewable material than wood, but it's also a lot more flexible. And we can pull it around these very tight radii here. And the reflections of the, the, the shadows of the bamboo leaves on the, uh, on the veneer panels create a resonance between the shapes of these leaves, the flexibility of this material, of these stems, and the, uh, the veneer panels and their geometry, their waving geometry. Moving on to the west lobby, uh, this is an installation by uh, Mandel Ortland, an American photographer. It's a, a superposition of several photographs of a, of a eucalyptus forest in um, the southwest of, uh, uh, of Sydney, a couple of hours away, and it's a UNESCO heritage site. So this is the vegetation of the place uh, as it would have been before the city uh, started uh, being built. So it's a window into this past in a way. And at night, um, the colors change very, very slowly on a, on a cycle and end, uh, start from red and end in blue and reveal each time a different layer of these photographs with different details of the, of the image. It's very visible from the street. So all of these, both of these lobbies participate in the street life. As we walk around the block into the park, we can see this urban chandelier, as we uh, ended up calling it, with an installation by the French artist Jan Casale. And uh, it's called Sea Mirror. It's a reflection of uh, light on the harbor, captured in video, and then used on 25,000 LEDs up there. So this entire reflected night functions as a giant LED screen, reflects in the facades of the building. And it reminds you that the choices that we make for sustainable, for, sta for sustainable future uh, aren't choices we can make in the future. We're going to have to make them uh, today, here and now. Thank you very much. <laughs>